preface that by saying that there is no exam on this content right now. Oh, come on. Oh. <laughs> the one area I'm good at. You'll get plenty of chances and it's worth plenty of points. 100 points on your barbell basics. Oh, yeah. What's up? Exam, but it's all practical. Exam, there is none. Oh, sweet. He's putting the books away. Everyone switches right off. Ah. Um, so we're actually just going to breeze through Barbell Basics again today and try to get started on uh, the topic of, of our next lecture. Because basically, the more compressed we can make these lectures, the more time we can spend on anatomy. Um, and I know that's where everyone is hoping that we'll spend a bit more time. Um, First, we'll just, um, how can we get rid of that light? First, I just want to sort of review the things that we've spoken about, except for breathing and the Valsalva maneuver, because we've already talked about that at length. Um, everyone's familiar with the grips, suicide grip, hook grip and conventional grip, the various pros and cons, all this practical stuff I think is where your guys, um, most of your strengths lie. Uh, this is the setup for conventional grip, again you'll have to know this, but you'll have to know this in the gym, not right now. This is a really interesting concept, and if I ask you what the irradiation phenomena is, you'll definitely want to know what that is. Bar path, we want it to be vertical. Um, or at least linear. Your center of mass, you all should now be familiar that this is when standing, this is over the midfoot. Lever system, someone's feedback is more time spent on principles of biomechanics. Um, do you all feel like if I remove these, this right side of these definitions, you just had the words, these terms, would you be able to define them? Would you be able to define what a fulcrum is? Can I get a, a nod or a, a shake? Sort of. We'll be. We'll be able to? Yeah. 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 Um, we'll spend a little bit more time on this um, over the next week anyway, so. Um, hopefully, you can all define what a force is. Yeah? Um, force arms, distance from the force to the fulcrum or the axes. Maybe we should define force. Right? Force is um, mass times acceleration, and it's basically how objects interact with their environment, uh, living or you know, rigid, uh, inanimate objects. Um, and so that's this playoff between force and resistance, force being our biological force, resistance being the the force of an inanimate object, or the inertia, I guess, of an inanimate object. Third class levers, Dani gave us a pretty good, concise explanation of what a third class lever is. There goes an example of one. Is this a confusing diagram? I'm just thinking about whether I should remove some of these bits and pieces to make it simpler. Any thoughts on that? Can you I actually wrap your head around this? I reckon it's pretty good. Pretty it's pretty good. good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. To be honest, it's about as simple a lever system as you can get, right? That, like I said, the elbow is about as simple as it gets when it comes to levers. Okay, I'll leave it. Okay, who wants to do that for me? That next slide. Someone who's not looking at the slide. What's the next slide? <laughs> Um, criteria for a strength training exercise. Our, our strength training choice rationale. Why it is that we choose the things that we choose. Jess, you, you know one of them? Uh, so, allows full range of motion around joints. Perfect, yep. Someone else, something else. Multi joint. Yep, yep. So, full range of motion. That's two. Multi joint. Fellas? Yep. Two more. Loads the core. Loads the core oh, and yeah. trev. <laughs> Come on, we're almost, <laughs> almost You're taking one. all the good ones. It's, yeah, yeah, those yeah. Those oh, it's almost one. there. Low hanging fruit. Ah, oh, it has um. Uh, I can't the word. Oh, the oh. strength um. Uh, has to do with load and potential. Can you read from there? <laughs> <laughs> it's so a high loading potential. That's the one. Yeah. 
I knew Allow, you knew allows it. you to yeah, you're up here. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much allows right. you to go through periodization for a long time, right? Like gives you plenty of room for growth. Cool. Um, I don't necessarily know all of these off by heart. It's more just sort of subconsciously when I'm assessing the pros and cons of an exercise. And our team out at Speedo, for whatever reason, consistently come to me with an exercise they've seen online and say, hey, Ralph, what do you think about this exercise? And most of the time, I go through this kind of subconsciously when I'm assessing a movement, as well as the biomechanics of the movement and what I know about anatomy and physiology and whether it's doing the specific job that it's set out to do well. That was pretty good, guys. You've given me hope. Um, that's just a quick review of some of the concepts that we went over last time. We also spoke about bilateral leg exercises, unilateral leg exercises, um, some of the accessory work that I think is really um, effective. And then we talked a little bit about the pillar as well, right? What, what, when we say the pillar, what is it that we mean by that? What is the pillar? Can someone give me an idea of that? Like that core group of muscles that go across the pelvis and not just like your abs includes like... Yeah, but maybe even more expansion, right? Like, so uh, a good integrated definition of the core is everything that acts on your pelvis, kind of like here. When we talk about the pillar, we talk more like stabilizers in this area, right? So essentially your entire um, anchor point, your entire foundation, so it could include the rotator cuff, the rhomboids, deep six of the hip, glutes, hip flexors, and then all of this stuff as well, right? Spinal erectors, rectus abdominis, obliques, all of that stuff. Anything that has a stabilizing function, anything that acts as a pillar, right, for your limbs to move against, we include that in our definition of the pillar. One of the things that is a, a major takeaway, um, for me at least, that I'd like you to leave with, is how we differentiate between the way we train uh, prime movers versus stabilizers and that we train them to do the job that they're designed to do, right? So all of the pillar musculature, we think of as stabilizers, we train them as stabilizers. And that means more isometric work, more low threshold um, coaching, right? Things that they're designed to do well is the way that we should train them. Whereas all the prime movers, generally, we're taught in most PT courses, to train everything as a prime mover. We do um, active flexion exercises for the anterior core. We do active um, spine extension for the, the posterior trunk, right? We do this stuff for the rotator cuff. When we should know that the rotator cuff is designed to stabilize the shoulder joint, and so doing exercises that involve high motor control tasks of having to balance something like an overhead hold or a, a Turkish get up, those things have more carryover into what that group of muscles is designed to do. So the difference between training a muscle by default as a prime mover, as opposed to identifying what that muscle is designed to do well, and then training it for that task. Would you do a, a like how, how would you like using the rotator cuff specifically? Mm. Would you approach that from both ends, of, of yeah. going through different angles, isolating yeah. the rotator cuff, mm. and then also that integration? How would you how would you generally approach, you put more focus on the stabilization and using the, the rotator cuff? I'd start very early in the piece mm -hmm. with just getting activity in that muscle, mm -hmm. and that's most easily done with something concentric. So maybe some of this sort of stuff yep. to get that muscle firing, but then transitioning off of that and into a higher motor control demand exercise. So more the stable, like the, yeah, the shoulder. more of that stuff that we're talking about now. Okay, yeah. Nice. yeah, like shoulder packing, overhead um, holds, um, you know, anything along, you know, along those lines. Yeah, yeah, good question. But yeah, I can't overstress that, guys. That's a, a really big concept that I hope you, you take away from, uh, from this course. Okay, power training. Um, we're not really doing this yet, right? So our next lecture is our stage two rationale. We bring it all back home. We've kind of, you remember the stage one rationale? That was our first lecture, right? Where we talked 
a little bit about what Stages is conceptually and, and how we deliver it. Our next lecture, we do that again. We say, okay, so you've got all this knowledge now about strength training, training and whatnot. This is how we apply it as part of Stage 2. Power training isn't part of Stage 2, usually, dependent on the person that's in it, but most general pops, they're not going straight into to speed training. Um, having said that, would be remiss to skip over it because we are talking about barbell lifts um, and they're a big part of power training. So power training involves the use of submaximal load, key, submaximal load, to perform reps at speed. That makes sense? So movement quality and strength, after those two variables, the most important element of physical prowess is the ability to recruit muscular force quickly. So to be able to express that strength at speed. Um, incredibly important in geriatric populations, for example, which for some people is a little bit counterintuitive. A lot of um, rehab that happens in geriatric pops are done slowly and involve isometric holds. You cannot help one of the big uh, concerns in seniors uh, when it comes to training is avoiding falls, right? You want to stop them from falling over. And doing things slowly doesn't help them stop falling over. Doing balance work, agility work, and power work, those things do uh, improve uh, reflexive um, contractions and being able to react to losses of balance. So power training has a lot of application outside of purely um, athletics. Having said that, there's also an increase in, in tissue strength, probably mostly due to just sort of a, a very sudden stop-start nature of, of power training. I don't, I don't want to get into the uh, biomechanics of deformable bodies, which is what uh, that reacts to, but at least intuitively you should understand and have an appreciation for when muscles contract quickly and also have to decelerate very quickly, you have a higher risk for, for injury, right? Like that's just pretty straightforward. Um, so you have to sort of take that into consideration when you're programming power training as well. Um, because of that, movement quality and strength are prerequisites, right? As opposed to something that you develop at the same time or after, you always want to build up a good, uh, solid, um, strength based before you get into power training. I like to say like in again in sort of younger general populations squatting body weight for example um, when dealing with athletes is something that I like to stick to uh, before we do any jump training for example. Um, yeah so some physics or biomechanic definitions um, I didn't actually add these in, but part of the feedback was uh, wanting some more information about this stuff, so that was a good sort of foreshadowing for this lecture. So force is mass times acceleration. It's measured by Newton, so the Newton is um, how we define force. Um, work is force over some distance. So essentially when a force acts on an object that's not moving, how much movement do you get from that object? Yeah, that's that's how much work you do. So when you apply force to a massive wooden table, <coughs> I can't overcome its inertia, but if I did, <coughs> how far I would move it would be the amount of work that I performed on that table. And then power is work <coughs> relative to the, the time frame in which in which the work is done. If you haven't studied biomechanics and you don't know these terms, let's just talk about that for a second. Just sort of try to wrap your heads around what that means. Particularly power, right? Because right now we're talking about power. So power is work. So force over a distance relative to the time frame in which that's done. Okay? Um, it'll probably be easier just to sort of have another look <coughs> at home and get a better idea for it. Three primary modes of power training. Plyometrics which is jump training or, or speed training done at body weight. Um, you can also do some upper body plyometric work, but it's mainly jump training. The Olympic lifts, like the clean uh, and jerk and the snatch. And then also just dynamic effort conventional lifts. So you can just as easily do a sub-maximum deadlift 
at speed and cool valve power training. It's not quite as good because just on a very quick sidebar, dynamic effort conventional lifts um, can be performed at any speed. And so when you're coaching someone through a dynamic effort conventional lift, the speed that they do it at is kind of up to them. Whereas to perform a clean, for example, you can't clean slowly. You simply can't do it. And so they, by, by default, must be full power. That's just the way the Olympic lifts work. And that's why, if you're into power training, um, the, the Olympic lifts can be such, such incredible uh, platforms for that. Just quickly, at mm. Synthes, are we allowed to drop weights? Like if someone wants to do power training? Oh, we'll be, we'll be dropping weights all, all awesome. over the place. Awesome. Yeah, keep in mind, guys, that Tempus is a performance brand and we embrace everything about performance. So the whole, all of that stuff, I'm, I'm, I'm working on the chalk thing, but um, dropping weights is absolutely, yeah, particularly if you're on the, the platforms, of which we have three. Um, so Olympic lifts, like we said, right, develop high levels of bar speed over a long distance and accompanied by a high loading potential um, that's what makes this brand of movement our best opportunity to develop power. Right? And just think about that for a second, like why that is. Power has a positive relationship with weight and distance and a negative relationship with time. So think about it, particularly think about the snatch, which is our best opportunity to develop power. The distance that the bar has to travel is from the floor to overhead. If you're holding onto a bar, you can't carry the bar over a greater distance than from the floor to overhead. So that already gives you the distance part of work, right? And then you've also got the force part of work. And then because this isn't performed as quickly as possible in order to get the momentum of the bar up, you can see how this becomes our best opportunity to develop power. If you can't grasp that straight away, just have a think about that as you're going through the slides. Think about what defines power, which is force, distance, and time. And then think about how that applies to the Olympic lifts and why they would be the absolute best. Because if you, if you compare, for example, a, a, um, a snatch to a deadlift, even if you do this very quickly, the bar only travels from the ground to the hip. And so that means that the work you've done on the bar relative to a, a snatch is far, far less, maybe less than half, depending on whether you're doing a power snatch or an Olympic snatch. But anyway, yeah, there goes Dimitri doing for him what is a very paltry 180 or so um, Olympic snatch. Yeah, very cool a, to watch. yeah a very good power lifter, um, well, weightlifter, I should say. Mm. Um, don't get me started on that, the whole powerlifting versus weightlifting definition of the sports, like it just makes no sense. Um, yeah, kind of known for also having a great physique, which isn't always um, indicative of a good lifter. Um, the clean. It's probably the easiest to learn, so it's where I like to start if I'm teaching the Olympic lifts. Who here has experience with the Olympic lifts? A little bit. A little bit, yeah? Cool. Mitch? No? Trev? No. Most frustrating part of, part of my lifting career. Yeah. So you've had some experience with the Olympic lifts? Or? Yeah. Done? No. Really uncommon, right? Like, they're too technical, basically. <laughs> if you do Cert 3 and 4, and you're not from an Olympic weightlifting circle, that's not what you've come from, Chances are you never touch them, and that's a shame because they're incredibly powerful things. Um, and I can show you some ways to coach them and to learn them that make things far, far easier. Um, yeah, so I think a lot of this will, will be really, really cool for you guys once we actually get into the gym and I can show you. I say that a lot, right? I know you guys think it a lot too. I know, we're all looking forward to getting to the gym. Um, yeah, I've pretty much just said what, what's in here, right? Um, unless you're working with Olympic weightlifters or other populations with years of practical experience, like potentially competitive athletes in rugby, for example, they do some Olympic lifting, 
If you're not working with those kinds of people, we start with medicine balls, south block, sandbag car cleans or hang car cleans. These are the variations that ask less of the wrists, shoulders and lower back. They emphasize the explosive portion of the movement and lend themselves well to teaching explosive attempt. And, and essentially they take all of the good parts of the Olympic lifts and make them easier to coach and also take out some of the injury risk. So you may never move on from using sandbags and medicine balls and you can teach people to become more powerful using those things. With seniors, for example, I'm just, I'm just doing this, I'm not going anywhere else. I don't even bother progressing to the, the uh, Olympic bar. So for a lot of people, that's a good place to be. Um, if you want to, from there, you can move on to coaching a full clean, you can add the jerk, transition into teaching people how to do a snatch. Um, you know, the world's your oyster, but in general, with people that aren't training for sports or the Olympic lifts in particular, um, chances are that you might just end up staying down uh, with the sandbag um, clean, which looks a little bit like that. So this is a little bit to get your head around. I'm not sure if I'm actually going to test you on this. Um, when we do test these barbell basic lectures, but these are, this is some of the terminology of the Olympic lifts. So if you're doing a power clean, for example, which is what this is, means that you're finishing in the standing position. If you're doing a full Olympic clean or snatch, you're finishing in a squat, right? Like basically, you're lifting the bar only as much as you have to, to get down incredibly quick and catch it down low in a squat. Yeah, and then you'd come out in a front squat, yeah, or an overhead front squat in, the ter in, in, in terms of the snatch. I, I just don't know why it's just finished as a squat. Like, isn't the whole movement with standing up at the end? What do you mean? No, 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 tell me. Like, I, just, I just don't understand the questions all. So you finish in the squat position, but mm. isn't the whole movement like you're in a squat and then you stand up again? Oh, okay, so, sorry, yeah, from the first one you mean? Yeah. Yeah, so the finished position isn't really in a full squat. Just the finishing position of the first movement right, isn't a full squat. Yeah, may maybe the wording is a little bit poor here. Hopefully you get the, yeah, the point though, that the power version of Olympic lift means you finish the second pull in a standing position, and the Olympic version you finish in a squatting position. The hang means that the starting position is standing. So if you're performing a, a hang clean, for example, you'll just go down to that uh, position of power they call it and then you'll be going straight up into triple extension and, and lifting the bar Yeah, a lot of this will be lost on you if you've never done Olympic lifting um, We'll spend a bit of time here because I think it's it's fun for one thing That's what I think a lot of people don't realize when you start teaching people how to do sandbag uh, Olympic lifts or uh, Medicine ball Olympic lifts. They actually enjoy it they enjoy the challenge of learning a technical skill, and they enjoy how quickly they can make progress. Uh, and you might experience that yourself. And then this is cool because you can transition to other really cool exercises like a, a medicine ball slam, which if you know how to do a snatch really well, it becomes a, a really good exercise. You know what, everyone know what a medicine ball slam is? It's where you pick the medicine ball up and you slam it down really hard. Not a particularly good exercise really unless you know how to snatch well. well. What's that? It's really irritating. Like in the gym, they just do A it. slam? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Loud noises? Yeah. Scare you? Not <laughs> scary, it's just irritating. Yeah. Yeah. Puts you off, you know? Yeah. yeah. So maybe you and Jess can have it out about dropping the bars. No, oh, not I, that, I, I but like, like just it. the repeated slams, like. Oh, yeah. for heaps of When reps. the PTs are just, yeah, just. Yeah, it's just annoying. Yeah. They use dead balls, it would be better. Yeah, we've got dead balls. A lot better than medicine balls. Agreed. Mm. I forgot that I had this in here. Take a second, just a couple of minutes. Trev, you can talk to Jess. Dani, you can have a chat with Mitch. Tell me which Olympic lift is, is uh, or just, I mean, it's a smaller group, so feel free to just have a, an open forum here. Tell me which Olympic lift requires the greatest power output and why.
preferably just have a think about it, but feel free to check. Run it through my head first. But just yeah, have a have a think about it and let me know. Talk to him about it. I want I want a, an open. I was, I was thinking that as well. Snatch, mm. probably. We're doing the most amount of work. For that then. Yeah, and why why is that? If that were the case, so you need to use. You're doing the most amount of work. Why is that the most amount of work? Distance. Like, do you guys understand? Jess, Mitch, Trev, do you know what work is now? Can you remember? And why is it more work in a snatch than in a clean? Because of the distance. Yep. Because what is the equation of of work? Distance times time. Yeah. Force times time. Force times distance. Force times distance. Sorry, is power work. is time. That's yeah. Power is time. Yeah. yeah. So power is rate of work essentially. So extrapolating that out, Jess, why would a snatch be more more work than a clean? This is very practical, it's just to do with the exercise. Do you know what a snatch and a clean up? Yeah, um, because you're lifting the weight over a longer distance and you... Greater bar greater path, motion. right? Yeah. It's a larger bar path, yeah. So if you did a clean versus a snatch and they took you the same period of time, the amount of power that you've developed in the snatch is far greater. Makes sense if you just think of that equation. Force, distance, denominator of time. If time remains the same, the distance is greater, then the power output is greater. Just a just an interesting thing to sort of wrap your head around. You can apply this to more exercises as well. Can you think about that just because you're using my more muscles as well? To get overhead you need to then use You need to be producing more yeah. force. And using more muscles entirely, so like you'll use your shoulders more as it is. Mm. Yeah, we're not talking head. about um, just, like, I know, like, muscular I force. Yeah. I, I know what you're getting at. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean that the same, this is a measurement of force at the bar. Yeah. So it's your overall system okay. of force that's being produced. Yeah. Um, so yes and no. It, yeah. it's, a, it's definitely an interesting thought piece for whether that, that involves more muscular force because yeah. there's a more dynamic movement. Mm. Coach McLean, um, I'm gonna skip it guys, I just wanna be able to show you this. Basically when it comes to the Olympic lifts, the first pull is off the floor, the second pull is kind of a transition from something a little bit slower um, from the position of power, getting up into that position, it's that, that sort of big hip drive that you see Olympic athletes using to get the bar moving incredibly quickly. And then, you know, they drop, right? They, they get underneath the bar really, really quickly. I'd like to have a quick look. It's good. Um, I follow a page on um, Facebook. It's all basically Olympic lifting. So they show the, the full lift. And it's, mm. all, it's all at world, li like world class level. Mm. And then they show the ultra slow motion of the lift. Hook group, that's cool. All, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. That's all. That's really, really cool to actually look at yeah. the video and see the movement. Like, yeah, guys, I'd recommend you all um, find the hook grip page on Facebook and mm. follow it. Awesome. It's not uh, necessary, but if you like performance and human movement, it's kind of cool just to watch because Olympic lifts uh, probably don't get the uh, props they deserve for how technical they are and how much goes into them. Like, if you know a lot about Olympic lifting. Watching people Olympic lift in slow mo is like yeah. a pastime. Like that's a that's an interesting thing to do. Mm. Yeah, particularly at the top level where there's kind of inexplicable deviations from what you think of as perfect form. You know, where the very best Olympic lifters do some things and you're just like, why are you doing that? Like that's not efficient. It's the same as people who watch, uh, you know, who analyze the gait of athletes like Usain Bolt. You know, the fastest man in the world with supposedly terrible form and then there's people that try to uh, you know there's the sympathizers right who say nah everyone else is wrong we need to all try to run like Usain Bolt or there's the other side of the fence that are like he's just such a genetic freak that he can still be the fastest man in the world even while being inefficient 
and that's I tend to lean more to that side, but um, certainly is interesting to to discuss. Okay, pushing, pulling. Basically, when we're looking at uh, upper body strength lifts, we categorize things by horizontal and vertical pushing, right? Just very macro level force vectors. So your horizontal stuffs everything through here, and your vertical stuffs everything up there. Right, so bench press is horizontal, pressing is vertical, generally. And then you've got the dip and things as well. So hopefully you all know this, right? Pushing patterns, recruit, sort of the front of the delts, the pecs, triceps, stuff like that. Uh, maybe the lats. Um, muscles of the trunk, the rotator cuff, scapular stabilizers are usually involved as synergists or stabilizers. Right, so in order for you to be able to push something very efficiently and powerfully, uh, you need to have really good stable segments around your arms and able to express that strength. Um, and then like, yeah, like I said, we categorize these into vertical and horizontal. Primary being the barbell press and the bench press. Um, just really quickly, this is just a little note on scapular positioning. And we've towed around this subject a little bit up until now. Um, this joint centration model of the way that the scapula moves. So there's something uh, which Dani will be in intimately familiar with, I hope, uh, called scapulohumoral rhythm. And it's essentially for every two degrees of uh, humoral abduction, you need another degree of scapular upward rotation in order for the joint to be able to continue to move correctly. And that ratio goes a little bit differently through flexion, but for us, uh, we're just gonna think of scapular and humoral rhythm this way, that for every two degrees that the humerus moves, you need at least one degree of scapular upward rotation to allow that to continue to occur. And you can see why that is, because if this humerus rotates up this way, it's just gonna mash up against the acromion, right? It's that bony projection of the scapula. And this is what I was harping on about um, a while back about the various pros and cons of telling people to pack their shoulder down um, ubiquitously, right? Like across all exercises. Never heard that before. To pack the shoulder? Yeah. When you're I'm so it. glad of that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but that's super, that's super common, yeah, pack, have you ever heard of that terminology, packing the shoulder? No. Okay. Um, yeah, that's something that's coached yeah, fairly honest, frequently. I wasn't, I wasn't, I'm not a big... You hadn't heard packing the shoulder? Yeah, yeah, I, I know. Yeah, I you hadn't heard packing the shoulder? Yeah. Really well, through, is the idea through a military press or a shoulder press that someone would say, pack your shoulder down? Yeah. Is that the idea? Just through everything, yeah. People, generally people say like, shoulders, like the press, yeah, okay, shoulders no, kind no, of thing, not, so. Yeah. I've never really heard it. But that's really good. Yeah. Yeah, and I just when you first went over it with him, it's like, yeah. like what is that? Yeah. One of Eric, told me who does that? that? One of Eric Cressy's pet peeves. Yeah, yeah, I can see why. Mm -hmm. Another great name in our uh, in our industry, Eric Cressy. Um, Particularly with shoulder stuff. Yeah, he's a he's a baseball SNC, so you can imagine why shoulders are, and scapular. Uh, mechanics are very important to, to him and his sport. Just on this note, quickly, is it similar? Um, oh, no, it is. But when you're talking about um, behind the head barbell military or shoulder press, mm. what about it? Well, why it's just not a good idea. Why it's right? bad? Yeah, just to sort of. Um, yeah, we're looking at subacromium space. That's it's all related, right? It is all related. It's a bit different. To the cervical stuff. stuff becomes a little bit more important there. Okay. Like if you have exceptional, and I mean exceptional thoracic extension, yeah. which is one or two percent of the population, mm. you might be able to get away with that. Yeah. Um, because it asks so much of your back to be able to get back into that position without something called uh, anterior glide of the head of the humerus, mm. which is how you see, we're going to talk about it in a minute, you how you see a lot of people rowing. If your rowing cue is get your elbows back, we've got problems because joint laxity through the front of the shoulder is everywhere in society. It's part of what having a rounded shoulder posture is, is that all of the stabilizers on the front of the shoulder are lax. 
So if you're having people row, what you're thinking of is being a, a postural correction exercise, but they're dumping their shoulder forward like that. Isn't that you're just, shoulder packing comes in though? Like, you're just reinforcing. Right? Yeah, so somewhere you may want to shoulder pack is in a row. I'm not saying packing the shoulder is inherently bad. Mm. It's good, right? Like that's why we have a corrective exercise to pack the Pop shoulder, the thing where I had you getting yeah. picked up off the floor. But if you're pressing overhead with a packed shoulder, yeah, that's, it's also like almost counterproductive. Oh, counterintuitive. Yeah. yeah, for some. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you'll but you'll see this all the time, even in rehab circles. Yeah. Like you'll see people doing mm. wall slides with their shoulders packed down. Like yeah, really jam those scapula down while you get up here. Well, you don't you don't want that. You want elevation through the through the scap. Yeah. Anyway. And I said, I think this is a really good uh, schematic of that to show that in order for you not to jam this greater tuber cord, your humerus, against your acromion, if you don't want that to happen, then this must rotate upwards. Everyone see that? And that's why we have um, scapular humoral rhythm. Similar to in the squat where individual uh, anthropometry of the hip dictates the way someone might squat. I think Trev, you might have brought that up mm. when we were talking about squatting. Same thing goes here, where the structure of your acromion will dictate a little bit how um, prone you are to shoulder injuries. I've had clients where it just doesn't seem to matter how much coaching and how much thoracic extension and scapular stability work we do if we're overhead pressing. They're just getting really complaining, you know, uh, of, of pain through their shoulder. And it could be, I haven't scanned them, but it could be because of their uh, individual anatomy. One of those things is having a hooked acromion, which as you can imagine, just means that this hooks over a bit more. And that means that you're just more likely to catch the soft tissues in that area um, within that space. So just a quick note on that before we get on to talking about the press. Um, this is Bill Starr, a juggernaut in uh, strength athletes. This is him pressing 160 kg. Yep, that's what he's doing. One of me in each hand. That's just, just insane strength, right? Just, just astronomical yes. strength, particularly for a guy of his size. Um, you can see he's got a bit of what we call layback, which is falling back a little bit. But if you're if you're pressing that much, um, I'm not saying, hey, Bill, you know, really need you to try to tuck your hip cage in. And, um, so the press refers to you know a lot of people think of this as an overhead press. If we have a bench press, then this can simply be the press, and that's how it was originally. Uh, that's what its original name was. Uh, it was mastered in the late 1800s, which is sort of a similar time frame to when barbell pressing or barbell exercise came along. And the bench press didn't even exist at that time. It didn't become popular until the 1950s. Not super important, but you know, just a little history lesson. It's a, an interesting point. Um, bench press has become the standard now, right, for uh, masochistic males to compare their bench press numbers. Um, having said that, the overhead press is a much better test of integrated pushing strength, right? Because you're standing up, you're loading your core. We've talked about the, the rationale, the construct we have for assessing movements in terms of strength. The press is, is superior. Um, back in those days, they also didn't have squat racks. So in order to press, you needed to be able to clean. So that's kind of cool too. Um, further integration in terms of the kinetic chain can be implemented using a push press, um, a jerk, um, you know, and, and other things along those, those lines. Those are other overhead pushing uh, variations. Although it's full body, it really is, uh, when done well. The press is generally considered to be for the delts and triceps, right, with a, a whole lot of isometric pillar work going on as well through the midsection and particularly around the shoulder. This is a really important point. 
Um, some trainers complain to me because apparently I'm the technique Nazi, right? So when some of my clients perform an exercise in ways that people think of as being with poor form, I tend to hear about it. Um, like, well, why do you let your client do that? Um, extension in the overhead press, to some degree, is almost required, right? Because if you don't, you're taking your nose off every time you press the bar. So a little bit of extension before you press is okay, as long as your glutes are on and your abs are on, because that means that the extension is limited to your hip. Nothing wrong with hip hyperextension. Hip hyperextension is a good thing. That's, that's part of being a good athlete. In fact, you could almost say that it's necessary to be a good athlete. Powerful hip hyperextension is what allows people to run quickly, for example. Um, but that's a little bit of an advanced principle. You need to be able to teach people how to reflexively turn on their abs and their glutes. And how do you reckon we might do that? How might we work on that? On the floor, in a bridge position, going through deep breathing, rib tuck, and glute thrusts. Like I said to you, it's the first thing I teach everybody I see, and it really pays off when it comes to things like this, because they know that feeling, they know how to form that force couple between their rectus abdominis and their glutes. So you use that as like an activation before you... I love you, Jess, yes. That's exactly how you do it. Um, that's, if they're not getting it here, you say, okay, rewind, put the bar back, get down on the floor, get that, that motor control, get that uh, kinetic awareness of the force couple between your anterior and, and posterior cores, um, and then go back to it and, and see if they've got a better, a better understanding of it. Uh, bench press, can't be bothered talking about it. Uh, pretty straightforward. A few little things about um, kind of joint angles in the bench press. Um, this is an efficient, that's an efficient, that's efficient. Same thing here, right? Same thing here for different reasons. It's not that um, this isn't efficient, it's just that it's gnarly on your shoulder. If you have your elbow traveling through the same plane as your shoulders, um, there's no upward rotation here. When you do a bench press, you pin your scapula back and down. This is somewhere you do pack your shoulder blades while you're lifting. And if you've done that and your arms are up here, you're just rubbing um, those tissues in the subacromial space you're rubbing against them and, and uh, aggravating them. A lot of people when they do bench press, they'll do it up here because they're a little bit stronger. You have slightly better leverage, but you're gonna hurt your rotator cuff. A lot of guys who bench press a lot have bad rotator cuffs. Part of the reason why. That's why we use this slightly oblique pattern. It's not quite as efficient, but it's still linear. What you wouldn't want is a curving pattern. And it allows you to dip your elbow underneath the shoulders at the lowest point of the bench press, and then you rotate them back out as you come up. Part of the reason why when you dumbbell press, a lot of people uh, who want to preserve their shoulders will do that as they come down, right? So that, that helps bring the elbows down and, and give you a nicer space up at the shoulder. The dip, this and this, and not this, and definitely not this. This, this, neither of these. Right, why is that? What's okay here and not okay here? Here you hear more blood. Yeah. Badly. This one in a joking sense, right? Like, mm. crazy thing is that's not. I pulled that from a website that sell exercise programs. That's an example of their dip. Literally, that's what he's selling. 
Um, this one, not quite as obvious, right? Like her torso straight. She also looks like she's in good shape. That will fool some people. The displacement of her shoulder here is still fairly exceptional. Really jumps forward a whole bunch. This is it in a little bit more um, detail with a little bit of a pointer to it so you can see what it is that we're talking about. Can come up with this to work? I could study them. Generally, yeah. doing, uh, doing an exercise back here just shouldn't exist. It's similar to doing stuff back here, outside of the exceptional person with the thoracic extension and the shoulder mobility and the incredibly open subacromial space that they enjoy just through having a unique bone structure. Outside of those people, these are just never a good idea, these exercises. Even then though, there's far better ways to train. Well yes, there's yeah. better ways, but at least you can do that without hurting yourself. Hmm. In those um, sort of anomaly kind of situations. He's that black, he's got no on you. <laughs> he's clueless, isn't he? <laughs> I thought we'd have Jarunda up there. Yeah. Um, big fan of Jarunda? Yeah, he's getting big. Yeah. I love this. This is a really cool image, and Arnie quite often does things with slightly um, different technique. But what you will notice about this is that his shoulder's in an excellent position. His back, his shoulder blades are active. Um, there's no anterior glide there through his shoulder. Um, so yeah, the dip is kind of our trinity of pushing movements, right? We've got one that's over here, we've got one here, and we've got one that's down here. Um, Prime movers are somewhat similar, although in this position, performed in a particular way, uh, you can get some um, active work through the shoulder extensors, like the lats, the most powerful being the lats and also the, the long head of the tricep. Um, everything else is active, unless you're doing it like Arnie, like most people that are on this angle will choose to switch on their glutes and their spinal erectors and get quite sort of pulled out behind them, right? Arnie, Arnie's kind of doing the opposite. He's like, he's like this to do that. Um, it still works for him. Had some of the best, aesthetically the best arms in bodybuilding ever, I think. Um, technique cues, we're gonna go over them another time. Point patterns, okay. Lats, carries major which is um, pretty much an extension of the lat, rhomboids, posterior delts, biceps. Um, a lot of that same stuff. Heavy pulls are also one of our best ways of training grip strength. Um, I don't need uh, straps to do one RM deadlifts, and I attribute some of that to having done heavy pulls and heavy lunges my entire lifting career. Okay, again, again. The amount of times I see this at our current gym with our trainers, the amount of times I see this, the amount of times I see this in particular, probably my biggest pet peeve because it's some people think that's good. Generally, if I point this out to people, they'll say, oh yeah, okay, I can see how that's not ideal. But most people will look at this and say, oh yeah, no, nah, that's good. That's exactly where I want my clients to be. Why do you think I don't like that? Yeah, some pretty, I can't even get into that position. It's a pretty exceptional lumbar extension. In order to do that, I'd have to imagine this person probably lives in a bit of extension, right? Like they're already prone to that. Rib flare will be pretty excessive. Um, damage happens at the thoracolumbar juncture where the facets of T12 and L1 meet. Um, that's usually what takes the brunt of the force. And if you get into spinal erectors and things around people's um, TL segment, um, it'll be pretty, pretty nasty for them. Anyway, dumping the shoulder forward, another word for that um, anterior glide. Half extension, bad for these reasons. 
Um, Penelay Row and chin ups for me are the best pulling movements that we can do. The skill and strength that you need to perform those movements um, mean that we need to start with regressions. So even though they're the ideal, we don't start there. Um, because most people working at, at um, high intensity won't be able to stop themselves from doing that. They have too much joint laxity through the front of their shoulder and it's just too much work for them to think about not, not dumping their shoulders forward. Pull-ups, clearly they're just pretty difficult. A lot of guys who don't work out won't be able to do them. All girls outside of athletics won't be able to do them. Um, so you need to be able to coach them up to being able to perform them. Um, we always start with standing or seated single arm cable row. It's the most isolated um, opportunity we get to work through shoulder specific mechanics of pulling. Being able to put them into a position where they can just think about activating their, their scapular retractors. I know a, lo a lot of you guys are pretty green to the industry, but almost always when you teach people how to pull, and I did this for maybe a decade before I realized what was going on, I say, yeah, I never feel my back working but my biceps are super pumped. I'm like, yeah, well your biceps is a synergist dude, like that's totally cool. It's not really the case. Like, if you're getting someone to pack back into a, a good shoulder position that avoids this stuff from happening, they will be active through their back. They'll be able to feel their back working. Initially, they probably have to dial right back on the weight in order to form that connection, that, that, that mind-muscle connection. But once they have, you start loading again, and their ceiling for growth will have dramatically increased. So even if you have to convince them to dial back for a bit, um, you can do so by saying, you know, I guarantee we're gonna add on top of your very best and, and some uh, by making these technique changes. Anyway, we then move on to one arm, inverted, prone rows. Um, lap pull downs or assisted chin ups are really good. Uh, regressions of the vertical pulling category. Finally, we get to do the fun stuff, which is the pendlay row and the pull up. And there's enough ways to load these that once you're there, you pretty much don't really have to move on. You can do some single arm, unsupported stuff if you wanna throw in some sort of rotary core um, challenge, right? Like a, a one arm, unsupported dumbbell row. Personally, I prefer to do some chop variations to work rotary stability and just focus on getting strong in the pendlay row, but um, once we're at the gym, we can meet and discuss those things. As long as you guys can give me a rationale of why you're doing one thing over another, I'm all for it. Here goes our progression chart. So, like I said, um, basically we've got, I should probably classify all of these, but we've got, this is your first step for your horizontal pulling, that's your first step for your vertical pulling. Then this is second for, what have I done here? <laughs> you guys can get to the bottom of that. That's your last one you got. Horizontal and vertical here you've got. Horizontal and vertical, horizontal and vertical. Just standing single arm cable row. Just horizontal. Okay, I think you can make sense of that. It's essentially what I just went through. I might change that slide, make it a bit neater. Um, most people will benefit the most from horizontal pulling um, and less vertical pulling. I tend to go with like a two to one ratio. So more horizontal work, less vertical work. Most people need more strength through their rhomboids and their upper and mid back than necessarily working their lats. Except aesthetically, right? Guys want the biggest lats they can get. So they're gonna want a lot of vertical pulling, but still, uh, for their shoulders health. For me, I always say to my strong young guys, they can only continue to bench press as long as they can pendlay row what they bench press. So they must be able to match what they can bench with what they can row. And that's a very practical way of ensuring that they have balance around their shoulder girdle. Not many guys will be able to do that. I actually prefer for guys to be stronger pulling than, than uh, pushing but that's a pretty good general rule. 
Here he is again, demonstrating a nice, even spinal curve, but still something would probably be like, really? You're gonna flex your back like that while you're rowing? Hey, it worked for him, right? And um, you can see again, his shoulder's in a pretty nice position. There's none of that anterior glide. And that's because he's got really good posterior delt and rhomboid development, which you can see is in his uh, back double bicep. This is the father of integrated pulling movements. There's no other pull other than the deadlift that more heavily engages the posterior chain, nothing else. Um, and the reason for that is because in the Pendlay row, at least the way that I coach it, which is to allow between zero and 10 degrees of extension when you, when you pull, so something like this, before you pull, you get a whole bunch of spinal erector work and isometric hamstring and gastroc engagement, as well as all of the really good strength um, work that you get through your, your shoulder girdle as well, right? So for me, this is just like a huge movement. So again, it's something that's not really taught um, when we go through our certification process. So I didn't get to start playing around with Pendlay Rose until I'd been a PT for a number of years, but when I did, I just went, yeah, okay, all of my clients, you're all going on the Pendlay Row, except for the ones that have back pain, right? Much better movement too than the traditional bent over row. It's such a massacred movement. People get all sorts of weird joint angle and yeah, yeah, they do. The yeah, absolutely. The other thing I love about this is you can start from a dead stop, right? The way mm -hmm. I, I coach the Pendlay row mm -hmm. is the bar rests on the floor between each rep, and again, this just helps. It's the same, one of the same benefits between the ab ab wheel roller and the sit up, right? Was that every rep they switch off their midsection and then they have to reflexively switch it on and you get a, a really good um, motor control education element as well. Same thing here, they have to switch everything off, everything has to be re-engaged each rep, so just more, um, more chances to learn how to be active through those muscles. Because if you think about it, when you're just in a bed row banging out reps, and you have constant tension, that may or may not be beneficial for hypertrophy reasons, but for um, motor control and strength, it's much, much better for them to have to switch off and back on every rep. Does that make sense why that is? You guys get that? Yeah. Done? Yep. Technique cues, I'm not going to get into it. The chin up. Excellent starting strength goal for weaker men and almost all women. And I just mean a single, right? Like most of my girls, once I've worked on them a little bit and they understand why being strong is such a beneficial thing, um, set themselves a goal of performing a single chin up um, unassisted. And that's a cool thing to work towards. Prime movers, the lats, biceps. Um, a lot of people think, seem to think that all of this stuff's super active as well, like rhomboids, all your upper back. Just tell me how that could possibly be. I mean, you're pulling through a vertical plane. Most of what's going on here is um, shoulder extension, right? And elbow flexion, you're essentially doing this. Right, but with a bent, a bent elbow. And there's a little bit of artificially uh, included retraction of the shoulder blades, but that's not against the force of gravity. Right, for your shoulder blades to retract, they don't have to fight against gravity here. They have to when you're down here, right? So. Vertical pull, um, horizontal pulling is a great workout for those muscles. I just don't get it. We, we constantly talk about working the rhomboids in the upper back with vertical pulling. Um, biomechanically, I don't see how that's, that's the case. You can artificially include that type of work, but not to a large degree. Would you say the activation's different between the pronated and the supinated? Yeah, oh yeah, sure. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it is, but still not in a way. So this girl, for example, she's a perfect illustration of that. She's artificially and very strongly activating her scapular retractors. You can see it in the way the muscles are bunched. But they're not doing that against the work of gravity, against the force of gravity. So it's not against a whole lot of um, resistance. Anyway, if anyone can come up with a reason why that would be the case, that people think of pull-ups as being great work for the upper body, please let me know, because I'd love to learn. Chin-ups are also excellent for, I don't know, I don't know what that was supposed to say. 
pinups are also excellent for we, we may never find out I think. Um, lots of people try to get a chin up and crash and burn because they don't um, just take some relatively simple but intelligent periodization uh, to work out how to do that. Most of that involves using tar bands um, and intelligent rip schemes uh, to get people to be able to do a single pull up. Um, it's an advanced exercise, you need to be pretty strong through your upper body. For this reason, we don't do it until stage two, and a lot of times until stage two later in the stage. Wait chin ups and chip ups on rings. <laughs> Uh, great, uh, great progressions. It's like the hybrid chin and uh, kip. Uh, yeah, but I'd never tell you the word kip, so no. I know that's not what was <laughs> what was typed there. Late at night, you were doing that one. Late at night, you were doing that one. Potentially, potentially, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, where are the I want those chips. Where are the chips? <laughs> okay. Um, Will we go through any of that like periodization to? Get someone to oh man, <laughs> periodization. That's like my love language. <laughs> you know, we all have different. Another ten word We all have different love languages, right? Like yeah. briefly, are we getting briefly? Yeah. 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 We we actually finished with periodization. So, what you'll notice across stage one through three is there's rep schemes, but I'm telling you what the rep schemes are. So that's following periodization. It's just planned. So at the end, we talk about periodization and how you. That's essentially. Beyond stages is what the lecture is, right? It's like how you paradise once someone's finished stages. And like I said, it's designed as a, a program to educate people on how to develop their own fitness programs and empower them to do it on, the, on their own. Um, but there's still a lot that they won't know. So the majority of the time, most people want to stick on and you know do another contract or even a third contract beyond the first one. Um, and that's where you'll need to know how to paradise programs really well. And it's just, it's another one of those elephants in the room. I just don't understand how that's not given more emphasis in the certification programs that we use in uh, New Zealand and Australia. Like, there's, there's just not enough talk about it. And it's so important. Yeah, we are definitely going to talk about that stuff, Jess. Yep. And that still took the whole lecture. I thought I was going quick. <laughs> 